I'm super excited uh, to be here today. It has been an incredible uh, journey for those of you I haven't had the chance or opportunity to meet yet. Again, my name is Tim. I'm just a guy from Michigan, and uh, it's my beautiful wife Ashley here. And uh, up on the screen, hopefully, you'll see a quick picture. Ooh, that's scary. You'll see a quick picture of uh, our children. The youngest there is Madison. Uh, we call her Maddie, and uh, she's just a little monster. Um, she gets into everything and like doesn't feel pain. I mean, she'll get knocked over. I mean, she got literally. She ran behind the swings one time, and somebody was swinging and like came back and lifted her up on the air and she did a flip and she just got back up and the swing came back again and hit her the other way and she did another flip. And uh, so, I mean, she's, she's a monster. She's a beast in training. Um, Kaylin, on the other hand, if you speak at her wrong, she will cry. Um, so anyway, uh, those are my kids and uh, I hope you all get a chance to meet them here in the new future, um, in the near future, the new future. I, I don't know what that is, um, but the near future, okay? Um, I got to tell you, um, I live in Michigan, and I, I think Michigan is beautiful, but, I mean, it is gorgeous down here. It is, it is beautiful. We drive across the dam, and we look at the mountains and the trees in full color and the hills, and we've been to Issaquina Falls. Uh, we've been to Chattooga Bell and uh, just all kinds of different places. It has been absolutely awesome. Now, this is uh, kind of the interactive part of, do I not move? Is there like a... So this is the interactive part of the service. Um, I am wondering if you could guess by maybe talking to me or my wife or uh, reading my bio, maybe you got a chance to see that. Maybe you've done some Facebook stalking. Um, if, If you or anybody could, any idea, share with everyone here my one of my favorite seasons. Does anybody have an idea about what one of my favorite seasons might be? Just shout it out. Hunting season. Summer. Anybody else? Turkey. You were in the last service. I remember you. Yeah, Tony. I've got my eye on you, Tony. So, yeah, turkey season. Turkey season is one of my favorite seasons. Typically back in Michigan, that happens in the fall or the spring of the year. And it was a few years ago now that I had the opportunity to go turkey hunting um, with a friend of mine named Brian. We were chatting online and um, I had uh, had a little incident that wouldn't allow me to drive for a little bit of time. And uh, I was just, he asked me if I was going turkey hunting and I said, no, um, you know, I can't drive. And, you know, he said, well, hey, I'll pick you up and take you turkey hunting. And I was like, yes, please. That sounds like a great idea. And so um, when he told me that, I started preparing. I I went out and got my licenses. Um, I made sure I had all my camo. Do you know what my favorite part of my camo is? My face paint. I mean, there's just something about it. When you, when you start putting on that face paint, it is amazing. It just, it like changes who you are. And so, um, you know, I'm putting my face paint. I'm, I'm working on my calls. You guys know what a turkey sounds like? <laughs> and you can, you can do that with a box call. You can do that with a diaphragm. You can do that with a slate. You know, I got them all. And so, you know, I was practicing and getting ready. And we even went out to his house and uh, started looking at where we were going to hunt. And... I was going to hunt on one side of the field. He was going to hunt on the other. And we just weren't going to shoot anything in between because that would be bad. All right. So, so he and his son were sitting over here and I was sitting over here. And, you know, we were, we were getting all prepped and prepared. And I say all that just to help us understand that there are things in life that if we want to be successful at, they're going to take a, a time of preparation. There's going to be some work that needs to be done ahead of time. And, and not only do I think that's true about turkey season, like I said, I think that's true about the different seasons in life that we approach. Anybody play sports, right? Any sports fans out here? You know, if, if you do a sport, whether it's hunting or running or something like that, if you're in band, if uh, you play an instrument, um, you know, those kinds of things, um, there's usually some practice that has to be involved in that process. I mean, you don't just show up one day and be like, I'm going to dunk a basketball and you do it. It just, it doesn't work that way. For me, I was in wrestling uh, when I was in high school. And so like during wrestling season, you know, we were all like practice and all those kind of things. But when it wasn't wrestling season, we were running, we were lifting weights, we were preparing for when that season would come. You know, uh, we got Thanksgiving and Christmas coming. And then later in the spring, we'll have Easter and you don't usually just wake up and the Christmas tree's all decorated and you've got food on the table. That doesn't typically happen. 
You know, if it does, please invite me over to your house. That would be amazing. Um, but, but usually there's this season of figuring out um, who's going to come and where you're going to have and, and decorating and preparing and getting gifts for different people and finding out who's going to buy for what person and those kinds of things. Um, same with uh, like Thanksgiving and Easter. There's planning for that, birthday parties, those kinds of things. Um, you know, school, right? We've got tests. We've got exams. We've got different projects. And we don't just show up and like, hey, you get an A. You know, that's not typically what happens. There's this preparation that goes into it. It's the same with academics. And really, if you think about it, even dating. I mean, how many of you just like showed up for your first date, like as you were, right? We don't do that. I mean, we got to put on our face. We got to make sure our hair is all good. You put on the right clothes. You put on your smelly stuff, you know, make sure you're all good. Because you want to have a good time and you want them to have a good time. Otherwise, you ain't going out on another date. All right? So there's this season of preparation. And, and right now, you as a church have actually been going through one of those seasons of life right now, this season of transition. And although that can be a little bit nerve-wracking, where's Amanda? Right, Amanda? That can be a little bit nerve-wracking, make you a little nervous. Some of the board members, I don't know what we're going to do, you know? Uncomfortable. Maybe, maybe it's exciting. But regardless of whatever season of life we find ourselves in, there's, there's three simple instructions that uh, I find in God's word that really he, he laid on my heart to share with us today, that if we employ these, if we follow these instructions, it doesn't matter what season of life we're in. We can find success. You see, in Colossians 4, you can turn there on your electronic device or your Bible. We're going to put it up on the screen. But in Colossians 4, the missionary church planner Paul found himself in a difficult Season, a season where he longed to be out serving the church, where he longed to be out reaching lost people for Jesus, but instead he was under house arrest, most likely in Rome. And while he was there, he was writing this letter to the church in Colossae during a season of confusion where people were coming in and teaching them these things that weren't in line with the teaching of Jesus that had been brought to them by Paul's companion Epaphras. And so it's in this context of confusion, of preparation, of not bearing where they want it to be, in Colossians chapter 4, that we read about these uh, things that we can do in the different seasons of our life. All right, so let's, let's look at those now. Here we read in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So again, no matter what season of life that you're in, dating, football, excitement, joy, holidays, transition, God's word encourages us with these three simple instructions. The first being the first four words of that passage we just read. Devote yourselves to prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer. Now this this word, devote, it means to be ready. It means to give attention to. And I think of all the individuals that we read or learn about in the scripture, Paul is the epitome or one of the prime examples of what it means to be devoted. I mean, this, this guy is sitting in prison because he is so devoted. He is so attentive to reaching people with the message of Jesus. And as he sits in prison, he's not whining saying, oh, oh, pray for me. Church in Colossa, pray for me. This is so bad. I can't believe that God is allowing this to happen. I don't understand why this is happening. Just, just pray for me, please. I need to be delivered. I need to be set free. That's not, that's not what he prays. No, if you go to chapter one, he, he writes, I'm praying for you. I can't stop praying for you because you're going to reach people who need Jesus. I mean, even when he asks for prayers for himself, it's not so he can be comfortable. 
It's not so he can be free. It's so that the message of Jesus can spread. The the Spirit's message through Paul is pray. Pray in whatever the season you're in now, the season you're preparing for, being watchful and thankful, looking for the opportunities to share the message of Jesus and be thankful. You know, we go back to my friend Brian who invited me to go turkey hunting with him. Almost immediately after my conversation with him, I began to sense the Holy Spirit just stirring in my heart. And I began to think, Tim, you need to have a conversation with Brian. Because I I knew Brian a little bit from high school, right? I mean, we were Facebook friends. We were that close. And as I observed his life, it was my perception that it was lacking. Okay, not that Brian was a terrible, awful person who was doing all these bad things. He had a good job. He had a wonderful family. He was concerned about doing the right thing. I, I, just, I just didn't see evidence of Jesus in his life. And that concerned me. And you know, it really doesn't matter how good a person is, how kind they are, how wonderful they might be. If they don't have Jesus in their life, They don't have life. They don't. And so I began to pray a very simple prayer on a regular basis after we hung up the phone. God, would you open a door for Brian and I to have a spiritual conversation? I started praying that a lot. God, would you open a door for Brian and I to have a spiritual conversation? God, would you open a door for Brian and I to have a spiritual conversation? And suddenly my preparation for turkey season didn't just include my face paint, okay? It didn't just include my calls. You know, it it wasn't that. It wasn't about finding good camo. It wasn't patterning my shotgun right. It It was about a heart being devoted to what God might do in that season of Brian's life. Now, friends, do you know what's so amazing about prayer? I love this about prayer. Prayer isn't about getting God to do what I want. Oftentimes we operate that way. We think that way. God, help me to shoot a big old turkey, right? God, help me to shoot a deer, right? And you guys ever pray prayers like that? God, help that girl to really like me, you know? We, we, we say, God, help me ace this exam. God, help me win this game. God, help me to win this wrestling match. Help me to get that raise or that job promotion. And yeah, I believe that God cares about that stuff, but I would suggest prayer is about more about aligning oneself with what God wants rather than what we want. It's about him. So when I started for praying for Brian like that, like I I mentioned earlier, no longer was turkey season about shooting a big bird. No longer was it about me. It was about what God wanted to do in Brian's life. And so as I prayed, I I began to pray with this expectancy. I began to pray with this urgency and readiness and willingness to step out and do whatever God would ask of me. And as, as I was being introduced to your church to welcome Wesleyan, I started feeling that same way. As I, I started to uh, talk with your board and in interviews and read the church bio and, and see how you as a people desired to share that message of Jesus with, with other people and that God would open doors. I was just super excited about that because I believe that there's a vision that God is stirring in your hearts to reach lost people and it's a vision that God's been stirring in my heart and my question is in this season of our lives whatever it might be of of school of academics of sports of football of job transition at welcome are we are we doing what Paul is telling and instructing us to do here are we devoting ourselves to prayer being watchful and thankful, asking for God to open those doors for us to reach our community more effectively, to reach the next generation more effectively, to have greater ownership and contribution to the kingdom of God in our immediate context. Is that how we're praying? And then, you know, we can take that because we can pray that as a church. God help us as a church to do this. But what about when we make it personal on an individual level? God, help me to have a conversation with my neighbor. 
God, help me to have a conversation with that uh, classmate that sits next to me in school. How many have a conversation with that, that person in my workplace? Right out on the front lines, the people that we're in close proximity to, because my friends were called to both individually and corporately be looking and praying for God to open doors for us to share the message of Jesus. But you know, it doesn't stop there. Paul doesn't stop there in his instructions because Paul and Timothy are super excited for the Colossian church. They're passionate for the Colossian church and the spreading of the message of Jesus. And we come to verse five and, and we read our next simple instructions, which say, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. And that verse is the crux of this next point. That no matter where we find ourselves in seasons of transition or preparation, we need to make sure that our actions are pointing to Jesus. Let our actions point to Jesus. Our response or our conduct in a season of life is an opportunity to point people who don't know Jesus to Jesus. The church in Colossae was being introduced to false teaching, right? How would they respond in that context? I mean, in our day, if people were sharing us things that weren't true, that weren't truth, that didn't exactly uh, comply with our Judeo-Christian worldview, we might get a little upset, especially if it had to do with politics, right? Oh, yeah, it's on now. I'm going to get on my Facebook, get on my Twitter feed, right? I'm going to blow you up, right? We might raise our voice. We might say some things that are unkind, that are harsh, that are argumentative. And that brings people to Jesus, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think about Paul. Here's Paul traveling around the world with a message of life for people who desperately need it. And they throw him in jail for it. I mean, surely he's got a reason to complain. He's got a reason to be upset with God. You know, stupid Romans throwing me in jail. Oh, I can't believe it. I'm trying to help you guys. Don't you see that? You guys are all high and mighty thinking you have the right way and serving the right gods. That's not how Paul responds. We don't see that happening in the scriptures, and it's clearly not what's being taught. In fact, I think we see the opposite. Paul being watchful and thankful just as he was instructing his listeners and, and being wise with his actions. In fact, there's this one time where Paul and his buddy Silas, they get thrown in prison. You guys probably remember this story if you read the scriptures, right? They're thrown in jail, and what do they do? They start singing and praising and worshiping God. And like there's this earthquake and the, the prison doors fly open and the Roman guard, he's like, oh, I'm gonna kill myself, they're free. And they're not going, that guy's getting what he deserves. They're not doing that. Man, they're like, stop. Let me tell you about what just happened. And that guy and his whole family get saved. They come to know Jesus. I mean, how cool is that? That how we respond to people in the different situations of our lives can actually lead them to Jesus. You know, I go back to my experience with Brian and the morning finally came for us to go hunting out behind his house in this 20 acre field. And he and his son are on one side, I'm on the other. And you know, I'm like, all right, it's on, let's go. And so he starts calling. And these, these turkeys come out of the woods from behind him, like this big old Tom Turkey and these three hens. And he can't see him. He doesn't know they're coming. He's on the other side of the field looking my way. And these things come beside him. I'm like, oh, it's on now, right? And they come right out in front of him, like five yards away. And like he takes his three-year-old son and he picks him and he sticks him out the window so he can eat the turkeys. And then he grabs his gun and they're so close. He actually has to lean out the window, right? And, you know, feathers flying everywhere. The birds on the ground flopping. Sorry if that offends you. It's just part of my life. And, uh, and, and so he picks up the bird and, you know, he's like, thumbs up. And I'm like, thumbs up, buddy, out the window, you know. And he's walking back to his house, you know, and they're all excited and everything. And I'm like, I wonder if that just screwed me up for the rest of the day. And so, so I'm sitting there. You know, I was happy for him and everything. But I thought, am I going to see any more turkeys? Because, you know, that's kind of my experience. When you mess things up, you don't see things. And so I'm sitting there. I'm waiting. And, you know, I wait long enough. And then I get my call out. And I'm like, <laughs> And I look out the back window of my blind, and guess who I see? Tommy Boy, just a bobbing his head through the trees. And he's got this big, long beard hanging out there, and he comes out in front of me, like 10 yards away. And I'm like, oh, buddy, it's on. And I get my gun, and I level it out, and I'm moving slow, and I get that bead, and I just squeeze that trigger, you know? And it's like, click. 
I was like, oh, that's not good. I misfired. So I rack another shell in. It's perfect. The bird doesn't like react or anything. He just sticks his head up in the air. And I'm like, great. Click. No, you got to be kidding me. Rack another shell in. He's like going away now. He's like, something's on. I don't know what's happening here. And click happens again. And I'm, I'm freaking out. I'm throwing shells back in my gun. You know, rack, click, rack, click. And, and I just, he's just walking away. And I'm thinking, I got a knife. I wonder if I can run him down, you know? And, and you know, I just, oh, you know, it's so sad. And I, I get out of my blind and I walk back to Brian's house and he's like, what are you doing? You know, he's right there. And I was like, my gun's misfiring. And he said to me, he said, Tim, just take my gun, go back out and get in your blind. I'm thinking, this place is screwed up. No way is a turkey going to come in here. He says, just get your gun and go back out. So I grabbed his gun and I went back out to the blind and I was sitting there and I, you know, thought, well, everything's all messed up anyway. I might as well just call. So, <laughs> and two jakes <laughs> come out of the woods and like come right in front of me. And I'm like, boom, right? And like there's feathers flying everywhere and I like fall out of my blind trying to get out and I pick it up and I'm like, yeah, buddy, and we're high-fiving each other and it's awesome. And then we're walking back to his house and Holy Spirit's like, hey, Tim. Remember what we talked about? This ain't about turkeys. And so I was like, I don't know what I'm going to say. So I just said what came out of my mouth. I just opened it. And I said, hey, Brian, can I tell you something kind of weird? <laughs> he says, yeah. And I said, ever since we got off the phone, I feel like God's just been telling me we need to have a spiritual conversation. And he said, you know, Tim, that's kind of funny. Because I never told you this, but remember when you called me last, uh, last fall to tell me about the deer you shot? Because my dad had passed away, and uh, usually when I shot a deer, I'd be like, hey, dad, I shot a deer. And we'd be like, oh, yeah, that's cool, you know? But my dad passed away, and so, like, it was my first season, and I was like, who do I call? I don't know how to do that. And Brian just came to my mind, and that just must have been the Holy Spirit working. Because I called Brian, and I told him all about this deer that I shot, but I didn't know but Brian told me that um, he had this friend who invited him to go to a Mormon church that year. And he, didn't, he wasn't really going to church anywhere. And so he and his family went and they were checking it out. And it was kind of weird. They had this thing called the Book of Mormon. And there were some like different teachings that he wasn't really used to. But, you know, these people were really nice. He really liked them. And they were like, you should come and get baptized and join our church and everything. And it's like, I, you know, I didn't know. And so... I was just walking out to my, my blind one day, walking across the field, and literally I just said, God, would you just give me some direction? Would you give me a sign? And I don't think he did that much. And he goes, and Tim, you never call me. I mean, literally, I never called him. He said, all of a sudden, I got done with that prayer, and my phone rang, and it was you. And you didn't say a word about Jesus. You just told me about the deer you shot. But when I hung up the phone... I remembered you from high school. And I remember how you lived your life. And I just said, okay, God, thanks for the sign. And a little bit later, Brian got invited to another church and he gave his life to Jesus. And his family gave their lives to Jesus. And now today, Brian is an evangelist. And I don't know about you, but when he told me that story, I was floored. I asked him if I could share it with other people because I love to see how God works in that story. I still get messages from Brian thanking me for how I was living my life for Jesus in high school. I mean, this is a guy who I never knew that I had influence on. And yet God was using my life to plant seeds in his for 24 years. You believe that? 24 years, and then I got to watch him sprout. I'm like, God is faithful. God is faithful. The question being for us today, how do our responses, our conduct, our behavior, and the different lifestyle in the seasons of our lives, in high school, in the workplace, and change and transition, like the Colossian church, like Paul, point people to Jesus? Because if you're like me, sometimes things happen in life that are unplanned, and your attitude doesn't really reflect Jesus, doesn't really point to him. Maybe that's your attitude at work. Maybe it's your feeling towards a certain people group or a certain age group or social class 
or gender or ethnicity. And that's just a barrier. But my friends, God calls us to reach out to everyone, regardless of those other issues. He calls us to reach out to everyone with the message of Jesus. And the time is now. There is a great urgency for people to know Jesus. And so my hope and my prayer uh, that as a church is that we will be watchful and thankful. And we'll live wisely in whatever the context we find ourselves. So that like the Apostle Paul, we become all things to all people. So that some might come to know, love, and follow him. That how we live our lives will speak to those around us because we just might be planting seeds. We're going to devote ourselves to prayer. We're going to live our lives in a way that points to Jesus. And number three, we're going to be ready and willing to speak into the lives of others. Paul shares with us in verse five that we should again make the most of every opportunity. But he goes beyond that saying, letting our conversation be always full of grace and seasoned with salt so that we can know how to answer everyone. And honestly, that's where a lot of us struggle, isn't it? We can show people the love of Jesus. But don't ask me to talk to people about the love of Jesus. Right? I, show, I, I can give you a hug. I can donate some toys to the toy shop. You know? But sometimes because of fear of rejection or maybe we feel a little bit inadequate, we stop short of speaking the message of Jesus. And for years, that's where I found myself. In another of Paul's letters we call Romans, chapter 10, verse 14, Paul shares with us, how can someone hear about him being Jesus unless someone tells them? And then Peter, another follower of Christ, shares in 1 Peter 3.15, if someone asks you about the hope you have as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Giving us this sense that our faith can't just stop with actions. Our faith can't just stop with actions amidst the various seasons of life. Eventually, it has to come out of our mouths. Our actions support what comes out of our mouths. But eventually, we have to be vocal about Jesus and his message and our love for him and his love for others in our lives. We have to be intentional about sharing the hope of Jesus with other people so that they can have it too in their lives. That's that's what it was like with me. When it came to Brian, God had put a burden on my heart for Brian. And I was like, how could I not speak? Right? He's put a burden on my heart for people so that they would know who he is. That's why I went turkey hunting that day. It it wasn't an opportunity to kill a turkey. It was an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was compelled to speak with him. But again, speaking honestly, I was intimidated. Right? And some of us think, you're a pastor, right? You shouldn't be intimidated. Right? Right? Listen, every time I open my mouth to talk to people about Jesus, I get a little intimidated. I get a little bit scared. But you know what? I have to be obedient. I have to share the message of Jesus with people because I love Jesus. And so in that situation, even though I was scared, I was just trying to listen to the Holy Spirit and trust him because that's the coolest part. See, God gave me what to say. I just live my life in the way that he directed me before that. And because of that, and being obedient, look what happened. Brian's life was changed, and I got to hear about it. And now I get to share that with all kinds of other people. And God gets to work in their lives. And that was a huge lesson in my life, which has led me to being even more watchful and thankful. A lesson that has led me to walk through even more doors and into conversations that otherwise I might not have had. Now I I read books on evangelism and and I learn methods and and I do this in preparation for when I'm going to encounter somebody who needs to know Jesus. And I'm devoted to these three simple instructions. And by the way, not only do I believe that there are Brian's in my life, I believe there are Brian's in all of your lives. Probably some Britney's too and some Billy's and some Bob's and some Barbara's. People who need Jesus. In fact, as as I was coming here, I watched your Vision Sunday message and I saw in the the church bio that there are 30,000 people in Oconee County. Is that right? Oconee County, right? I got to work on my pronunciation of that. 30,000 people who do not yet know Jesus. 30,000 Brian's 
and Britney's and Bobby's and Billy's and Barbara's who need to know Jesus, who we can be praying for, who in our responses to the life's situations around us, we can point Jesus to, who we can enter into spiritual conversations with, which is why each of us needs to be praying, which is why each of us needs preparing and growing in our faith and using our gifts, right? Everybody's got a gift. And God wants you to employ that gift in a way that helps other people come to know him. Because friends, listen, we're on a mission. We're on a mission. This isn't a country club. We are on a mission, a mission that Jesus Christ has called us to right here in Oconee County. And all of us have something to contribute, as God's word tells us. And there's nothing of more value or significance that we can pursue than helping somebody who doesn't yet know Jesus, take a step towards Jesus and begin that journey of transformation into his likeness. I mean, is that not worth everything? Is that not worth everything? I mean, what would you give for your family to know Jesus? You got unsafe family? I got unsafe family. I got family who doesn't know Jesus yet. What would you give for your classmates to know Jesus you got people at school who don't know who Jesus is. What would you give for your coworkers to know Jesus? You got people you work with that don't know Jesus? Because if Jesus gave everything for us, how could we give any less? And I love, I love how Paul ends um, the book of Colossians. I love it. This is what he says. He says, remember my chains. Remember what I was willing to do to bring the hope of Jesus to you. Remember when I modeled before you, whatever it takes. And, and maybe that means stepping out of our comfort zone, going to a location or a place that we're not quite comfortable with and building relationships with people so that we can help them take steps towards Jesus. Looking for those uh, doors towards spiritual conversations. From a more strategic sense or corporate sense, your leaders have been sharing with me, have shared with you that there are some tremendous opportunities in this area. There's opportunities for kids and young families uh, to develop relationship with the church, relationship with Jesus Christ. Opportunities to create environments for people of diverse backgrounds to worship God. And, and really my heart, friends, multiplication. To reproduce ourselves to plant churches and surrounding communities and neighborhoods and so as, as God grows and burdens our heart for people let's be devoted to prayer let's live in such a way that our actions are going to point to Jesus and let's be willing to walk through those conversational doors and potential ministry doors that he opens because these are the instructions that we find in his word Instructions demonstrated and written by a man who was willing to do whatever it took to see people come to know Jesus of all different backgrounds, of all different ages, young and old, near and far. And I believe that that same call on his life is God's call to us today. And so let's finish up by asking very simply, what's our next step? What's my next step? What's your next step? What door do you need to walk through this morning? And maybe it's prayer. And you're like, Pastor Tim, it's definitely not prayer. I pray all the time. I pray when I go to bed. I pray when I get up. I pray for my food. I pray for safe travels. I pray that my family will be safe. And those are great prayers. But do our prayers align us with God's will and plan and purpose for our life? Or are they all about us? Maybe that's our next step, to simply change the way that we're praying. To be a little bit more aware of those people in our life who need Jesus. Other of us, maybe there's some things in our life that are keeping people from seeing Jesus. You know, maybe when we go to work, we just like get a grumpy attitude. Y'all like grumpy people, right? We just like, don't talk to him. You know, he's a Christian, man. He'll bite your head off. You know, maybe that's a barrier. Maybe how we treat our spouse in public, maybe that's a barrier. Maybe how we treat people of a certain ethnicity, maybe how we treat people of a certain age group. God calls us to reach people that we are uncomfortable with. God calls us to develop a love and a passion for people that maybe are outside our comfort zone. God loves you. 
right? And he all makes some people uncomfortable. <laughs> God loves you. We're called to share the love of Jesus with whoever. Maybe we need some help with that. Maybe we need some training. Maybe we need some people to come around us and, and help us be accountable to the mission that Jesus has called us to. And, and maybe that's going to happen and celebrate recovery. Maybe that's going to happen in, uh, in one of the connection groups. Maybe a Bible study. Maybe that's going to happen in Kids City. Maybe, maybe that's going to happen in, in student ministry. And then maybe, just maybe, there are some of us who are sensing, I need to have a spiritual conversation. You know, maybe when I was talking, there was a name that popped in your mind. Like there's this girl at the gas station where I might buy my coffee every morning, and she just looks like there might be something in her life that's missing. Whatever the case, would you be courageous enough just to simply begin a conversation? I mean, you don't have to close the deal. You don't have to be a car salesman. Sorry if you're a car salesman. All right? It's not like when you first enter in the conversation, you have to close the deal. You don't have to do that. You just got to begin the conversation and keep it going and see where it leads. See what God does. And remember, when you do that, don't try to argue. Don't try to fix the person. Just be full of grace and season with salt. And friends, if we do these three simple things in all the seasons of our life and all the transitions and the ups and downs and wherever we find ourselves, if we devote ourselves to prayer, if we point people to Jesus, and if we speak life to other people, believe me, the Holy Spirit is going to blow us away. And that 30,000 in Oconee County, Oconee, Oconee County, that's going to drop to 25. And that 25 is going to drop to 20. And that 20 is going to drop to 15. And God is going to work not only through this county, but far beyond what we could ever ask or imagine. And I can't wait. I can't wait. And so I'm going to ask you, church, to pray with me. And I'm going to ask you that as we pray, you be obedient to the Holy Spirit's pulling and direction on your life.